Now, just to give me a feeling, how many people in this room would consider themselves to be not plant scientists? Not. And how many are not scientists at all? That's good, too. Okay. So I want to talk about, uh, I want to give an example almost of how basic research has been providing the knowledge and the tools to try to aid plant breeding. Uh, photosynthesis is the process whereby plants and algae use light energy from the sun to convert carbon dioxide into sugars and at the same time to release oxygen. Now, these sugars plus other energy from photosynthesis is the basis for the production of plant biomass and algal biomass. And this is basically the center, the basis of all life on Earth as we know it because little cuddly things and less cuddly things eat plants. They then release CO2 again and they need oxygen. So we basically have this cycle of oxygen, carbon dioxide and organic biomass, food. Now research into photosynthesis and plant growth is important, I think, for two fundamental reasons. One is that the sequestration of carbon into plant matter and it's then its use by plants and animals and microbes is the basis of the global carbon and oxygen cycle, which I have illustrated here. And the important thing here is I think we all know carbon dioxide concentrations are rising. Most of us are convinced this is because at least partly of human activity. But the important thing to see here is the cycling of oxygen and car of carbon due to the, the natural environment, to plants and the things that use plants is much, much bigger than what stupid humans are releasing at the moment. And this means that parameterization of the models of how our activity impacts on the global CO2 depends on a lot of implicit assumptions or parameterizations from basic plant science. I shan't come back to that later, but it's important. The second is, of course, that plants are the basis of, of, uh, of our food demand, and that's what I want to focus on today. Now, there are many schemes of this sort where the world population has been rising. Malthus up to now was not correct, and it was not correct because the food production, the global food production, has kept up with the rising population. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this large population. You'll notice here there's a slight blip, and I'll come back to that later. Now, this in the last 60 years has been dramatic, and plant breeding has contributed substantially to this increase. Not the only thing, but it's thought that probably 40, 50%, depending on how you do your sums, is due to breeding alone, which you can check by just taking cultivars from the 1950s, growing them next to modern cultivars, and looking at what the changes in yield. And at the same time, Agricultural yields have been pushed up by the intensification of agriculture. This involves nitrogen, also the use of water, which I'll come back to later. This increase in yield is important. It's not a luxury because the availability of land for agriculture is falling due to it being used to build garages and airports, due to the land being degraded, and it's about halved and it, because the population is rising. So there's about half as much land available per head now as in the 1950s. And this is projected to increase further, this problem, and this will particularly change in places like Brazil, China, and India. Also Africa, although that's a special issue because of the real problems of the land use there. This is why yield is important. This is a hypothetical example. This is the land actually used for cereal production between, I think, about 1950 and now. If yield had not gone up, this is the land we would have needed. We would have to use twice as much land today to produce food as we do if we had not increased yield and the land's not there, period. So increasing yield saves land and if chemical inputs are to be decreased in the future, the contribution from plant breeding and other things, I think agronomics is also a very, very important factor here, is going to have to increase. Okay, now this is the bad news. It's a complicated slide, but the take-home message from this slide is you can see that most of these, this, this is, I think, rice, wheat, and maize. Maize is still doing halfway okay, but look at wheat and rice. The yields have plateaued. 
The increase we were counting on and we're having between 1950 and about 25 are now looking as if they are plateauing off. And this is another way of looking at it. This is the change per year of global cereal production. And this is the world population, the change per year. Yeah? Back in 30, 20, 30 years ago, cereal production was increasing more than the world population. By 2010, we'd reached a point it was no longer rising faster than world population. If this trend goes on, we are in deep trouble. So this is a couple of quotes. I don't want to go into this in detail, but I think everybody in this room is aware of the problem that we have. Rising population, rising standard of living, degradation of the soil, and probably climate change as well. And these are just a couple of headlines out of the last year. I want to give here one very specific example. Now, this is an extreme example because Australia is a country which is very, very sensitive to fluctuations of climate. But I just pulled this out. This is data from the Australian government, which does not believe in climate change, strangely. But this is the changes in rainfall over the last 20 years. Red means less rainfall. There's no blue. It's all red. This change is the average temperature, 1910 to present. You can see it rising. And this is extreme events, high temperature events. So less water, higher temperature, extreme events. And this is modeling based on what people empirically know about the requirement that plants have, how temperature and water availability affects the yield. This is modeling of the change in the yield you could get, the maximum yield you could get with that temperature and that water over Australia. Everything is yellow, which means bad. Red means basically no yield anymore. And the take home message of this study was climate trends in the last 25 years are leading to yield losses, which are equal to or probably exceed the gains which are made by plant breeding and improved agronomic process. That means we are running faster and faster to stay in the same place. Alice through the mirror, Alice through the looking glass. And this is, I think, a scenario which a large many other parts of the world will be looking at within the next 20 to 30 years. So crop yield. We can start off with yield potential. That is what you could produce if everything was working using the water and the nitrogen and the, the sunlight you get. Then we have loss because we don't harvest everything. You, know, you don't eat the whole of a potato plant. You only eat the tubers. Then we have after harvesting, we have loss until it gets to the consumer and then this is a big topic now, of course, consumers throw away a lot. So all the way along this thing, there are losses. Some of these can be tackled without plant breeding. Agronomic practice, which is a very, very broad word, but a very important word. This is a very interesting article, which sort of charts out if we could use the nitrogen and water more effectively, which is there, how much could you increase yield? Everything which is red here, areas, indicates these are areas where you're not getting what you could, and you could do this by really relatively simple agronomic advances. But many others you can't do much about. And what's the breeding can do? Well, breeding can increase the yield potential, the maximum you could get off a certain amount of field. It can also decrease the losses and the waste, the pathogens, weeds, Lack of water, inefficient uh, fertilizer. Can you make plants more water use efficient? I'll come back to that. Ease of harvesting. A lot of breeding has been driven so you can just go across with the combine harvest and take everything out of the field at one time with lots of problems which come with that. Poor storability, loss in processing, and many of these interact. For example, if you could make plants more storable, then you wouldn't lose as much and you wouldn't need as much energy in transporting and storing them, as an example. So... Let's now go to crop yield. What have breeders done in the past? Now, this is simple. I've left some things out. But basically, they have packed plants closer together so you can get more plants per hectare. And this involves changing the way plants behave so they don't run away from each other or run up from each other. The optimizing leaf angle so you can get the sun coming into these packed things. Getting the canopy to close earlier, maize. Look at a maize field in June. All the sunlight is hitting the earth. It's wasted, just wasted. So you could plant it earlier. Optimizing flowering time, when the seeds are made, how much the biomass is actually in the bit you want to harvest and eat. This has been a major shift. Optimizing composition, pathogen rebound systems. Now, many of these traits 
it's becoming, people are now starting to think we've optimized almost as far as we can. There's one which for sure will go on. This pathogen defense is a non-stopping battle. It's just like espionage, counter-espionage, espionage against the counter-espionage, counter-counter, counter-espionage, and so on. Yeah, that's the that's Z plan from Jeff and Jonathan J.J. Jones. One thing which has not been really addressed at all is photosynthesis. And there can be many reasons for this, which I'm not going to go into. One is, of course, is this. It's two billion years old. It's already been optimized. What can we do about it? Now, now we have to think back. It's been two billion years old, but the environment in which it operates is changing all the time. One very simple thing is the carbon dioxide concentration is falling, 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 now rising. I'll show you, this has a massive effect on photosynthesis, so we'd be very naive to think that photosynthesis is actually optimized to present day conditions. And then many other things changing as well. There's a second which I'm gonna jump over, uh, I think, because it's not relevant to the examples which I'm bringing. So, does photosynthesis yield, uh, limit yield? I think a very simple answer comes from experiments, and many people have done this, I've just pulled out one example, where sophisticated engineering technology allows people to increase the carbon dioxide concentration over large areas in the middle of a field over the entire season. The, 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 the technology is very sophisticated and expensive. And this is the result of a meta-analysis made by, what, of, I think, of course, uh, you can read 124 manuscripts, more than 40 species, 12 different of these sites. Photosynthesis, by pushing the CO2 up to 550 to 600, that's not a big increase. Photosynthesis is rising by about 30%, which is actually exactly what the models would predict. Yield is going up on average by about 18%. Not as much as photosynthesis. This, what this tells us immediately is more photosynthesis will make more, mean more yield. It also tells us there's probably bottlenecks downstream as well, and the stuff to do in getting plants to use the photosynthesis more effectively. I may get onto that at the end of the talk. So, so it's an age-old pathway. It's important for yield, can we? And now I just want to highlight two papers where what I call knowledge-based modeling. This was really very, very precise mathematical modeling based on knowledge of the how the pathways are structured, their stoichiometry, the properties of the enzymes, a lot of physics and chemistry. Two very important papers came out. Oh, I'm gonna to try to avoid naming individual scientists. If I do, it's an accident because it's always work done by people together, unless the scientists did something before about 1980. Uh, this is a large combine where they basically came out and said, uh, plants are much less effective than photovoltaics. Hit the voltines. It depends on exactly how you define it, but clearly they showed that the light energy could be used more efficiently. This is a second uh, paper from another group of people, came to basically the same answer, that photosynthesis is not very efficient in terms of its use of light. They said probably five to 6% of the light energy is actually churned into biomass at the end. And this is optimistic, but it ignores the fact that the photosynthesis will op often be operating in non-optimal conditions. So we're looking at even lower. So both of these highlighted there is stuff to do, and they were followed by a whole series of papers which in a much more detailed way were analyzing out where might be the problems in photosynthesis, and particularly, where can we do something? Some of the losses of energy, there's probably nothing we can do about it. They're just core in the physics of the whole process. But there are some, where could we do something about it, either as a scientist helping breeding or scientists promoting GMO, gene technology approaches. And if you want to read into this first, as a non-specialist, I think the best place to go first are the, basically the web pages of two or three of the consortia which are working on this. RIPE from the Bill Gates Foundation, uh, a thing called Photosynthesis 2.0, which is, and, and then Translational Photosynthesis, which is a consortia supported in Australia by the ARC. And they're a really good place to start if you just want a very, very simple look into this. So. Photosynthesis is a complex process, just as Ottoline said, the scales of size, the scales of time. Photosynthesis starts off with things which are happening in the 10 to the minus 12 seconds, or the 10 to the minus 15 seconds, and then it goes out with a maize field growing on the field in years. That means I could expand it probably from the, the sun to Pluto or something. It's colossal. The size alone, apart from the scale, both of those are in there. I want here to focus on one part of it. 
so I can explain the biology behind it, rather than trying to do everything. So I'm not going to discuss anything to do with the direct use of light. What this does is it creates chemical energy, reducing power, and this is then used to drive the biochemical reactions, which turn CO2 into sugars. Now, a little bit of history. This was elucidated in the 1950s. It was elucidated not with genetics, because a plant without photosynthesis is dead so they couldn't use genetics. It was elucidated by, tip, by basing pulsing chlorella with radioactive CO2, pulling them, killing it in ethanol or methanol, nice way to go, <laughs> separating out the metabolites on paper chromatography. The tanks are this big. You know, I've done this myself. It's surprising I'm still living. And then using autoradiography to find the compounds, and then what they learned is which compounds are labelled in what sequence, and out of that they basically deduced the pathway and then looked for the enzymes, the proteins, which could catalyse that pathway. This sounds easy. It took eight years. It was a very big struggle. Calvin, uh, Calvin got the, ben the, the Nobel Prize for this. Almost everybody working in the field now thinks Benson made the major contribution, and it's now called the Calvin-Benson cycle. Please remember that. Okay, so this is the cycle. I'm not going to detail. It's complicated, as most pathways are, but it can be brought down to a very simple thing. You start off with an acceptor, five carbons. You stick a carbon CO2 on it. The product is two three-carbon products. Most of these are used to make the receptor again. Some go off to be used for end product synthesis. The energy all goes in to basically making the acceptor again, almost all of it. The key for the rest of the talk is a thing called rubisco. This is the enzyme which incorporates the carbon dioxide. So this is the core of photosynthesis. Now, after discovering the Benson cycle, there was some very perplexing stuff. If you take the oxygen down, air's 21%, take it down to 2%, you stimulate photosynthesis. Why? Why? It doesn't make sense. The key to understanding this was work which was done on the enzyme, Rubisco, and they discovered it also reacts with oxygen. Not only with carbon dioxide, also with oxygen, and it makes a side product. I'm not even going to give the name of the side product. But if the side product accumulated, the plant would die. Period. This side product is removed in a complex process called photorespiration. So basically, it's oxygen coming in, making a side product, and in this pathway, you lose CO2 and you waste energy. So this is a wasteful cycle, and it decreases photosynthesis in our current environment by about 30%. Every third to fourth reaction is the wrong reaction. Okay. Now, a little bit of light humour. Why is this this major mistake in the middle of photosynthesis? Well, let's go back two billion years. When photosynthesis started, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, and there was probably 20 to 40 percent carbon dioxide. So the Calvin-Benson cycle developed in an, where there was no oxygen. The side reaction didn't matter. There's a nice story where the enzyme came from. It usually probably used oxygen in its original life. As the algae in the sea carried out photosynthesis, they produced oxygen and they pulled the carbon dioxide down. So that by about 500 million years ago, this was just the algae. They'd already created a situation where there was about as much carbon dioxide as oxygen. That means the side reaction was becoming a problem. When the plants got onto the land, well, they went crazy. And we ended up with 21% oxygen and sort of homeopathic amounts of carbon dioxide. You could sum this up from the evolutionary side, saying, um, some forward planning might have helped. Now to the biochemistry. Why? I've put you out. Rubisco is slow for an enzyme. It's very slow. Most enzymes are really fast. It's pretty slow. And this means there's a lot of it there. This is a bad thing because it means most of the nitrogen in a leaf, the protein, is in Rubisco. Why is it so slow? Now, I could bore you with two hours of enzymology, which I love but most people hate, but I'll sum it up in this way. If you are doing a difficult job and don't want to make mistakes, you have to do it slowly. If you want to separate between the carbon dioxide and the oxygen, this can only be done by doing it slowly. And this is exactly what the enzyme does. And so about 10 years ago, people in the field had decided there's a trade-off between the specificity using carbon dioxide and not oxygen and speed. 
And this, this trade-off is there across all algae. The rubiscos, the ones which are fast, use oxygen faster as well, or too much oxygen. The ones which are slow can sort of keep the oxygen more out of the way. And they said, this is inherent in the enzyme. You know, if you want to do a difficult job, you have to do it slowly. No way out of it. Now, one further point about this problem of the unspecificity. It leads to water loss. The reason is the following. The leaf has little holes in the surface called stomata. They let the carbon dioxide in to rubisco. Now, because rubisco wants to have a lot of carbon dioxide, these holes have to be open. Well, if you have a big open hole, water goes out. And that's crazy. So you lose water. That means photosynthesis, the loss of water, are unavoidably linked. Unavoidably linked. So let's try to improve rubisco. Well, I think I'm not saying anything wrong here. Repeated attempts to improve rubisco over the last 30, 40 years by genetic engineering have not yet worked. So, one approach here is to ask plants if they found a way. One of the things that we've realized increasingly in the last 10 years is that although photosynthesis is a very old process, there's a lot of diversity in different plants in exactly how they do it. Not the pathway, but how they regulate it, how the leaf anatomy is, how they poise it. And so what scientists are now doing is they are screening across different species, algae. I've just given two examples here, looking for rubiscos with altered properties. They then take these properties and they fit them into very sophisticated models of how photosynthesis is operating in our crop plants, and they ask which of these altered forms might work better. That's the first part of the problem. That's the easy bit. The next is to put the endogenous protein in, and I'm not going to go into that, and that is a very major problem which requires a lot of basic research. But the first step is just to find which ones should we take to use. Now... If you can't make rubisco better, then why not try to make photorespiration less wasteful? So photorespiration is a complicated pathway. It was largely, I think, unraveled using genetics. Uh, people, and this was Chris Summerv and his wife, Shauna, who basically said, let's find plants which, which can grow in high CO2, this gets rid of the oxygen reaction, but get sick very quickly in air. Put them back into the high CO2 so that you can recover them. And they pulled out one mutant after the other, and this basically led to the elucidation of the scale of the pathway. And I would just say it's long, it's complex, it leads to wasteful loss of CO2 and ammonia that have to be refixed, and it wanders around all over the cell. It's a bit of a mess. And so, obviously, people are asking, can it be redesigned to make it less, less wasteful? And one set of approach here is to move the loss of the CO2 so it's lost as close to a bisco as possible. So the rubisco can grab it again, not somewhere else where it can wander out of the cell. And this is one approach which has been implementing this. Uh, this was published in Science, I think, earlier this year. Uh, yep, what in addition they did is they also blocked the, in, the endogenous pathway to make sure that all of the side product had to stay here and couldn't go wandering around the cell on walkabout. And those were the answers they got. This is growing tobacco in the field. There have been many studies claiming stuff in growth chambers and greenhouses. This was out in the field, and they are looking at significant increases in yield. This was tobacco, and I'll come back to that in my last, last slide. But this, is, I think, is still a very significant approach. I'll just point up here, other groups of scientists are trying to do even more crazy things and design totally new pathways with totally new enzymes. Now, this is early stages, but we have to see how it works. Now, how can we decrease the water loss? Uh, this is a very, very important paper. I'm going to throw up a couple of papers. What this paper, what does it mean? What this paper meant was that as the rate of photosynthesis increases, these holes in the leaf, they get bigger, and as photosynthesis gets slower, they close again. So you can imagine what that means. As you need a lot of carbon dioxide, you open them, then you lose more water. But when you don't need the carbon dioxide, you close them, so you don't lose, lose water. And this led to the concept of water use efficiency. How can you maximize the rate of photosynthesis compared to the amount of water which is lost? And this has been an active field ever since this paper came out. It really was a fantastic paper. 
Then, and now this is a paper whose title is going to be really obscure to almost everybody, isotopic composition of plant carbon correlates with water use efficiency of wheat genotypes. This is probably one of the most influential papers in understanding water relations in plants that's appeared in the last 50 years. And I'm going to try to explain what it is. It's a challenge, so if some of you want to break, then turn off for the next, slicks, for the next animation. So, most carbon has a mass of 12, but there's a rare stable isotope with a mass of 13. That means it's a little bit fatter, okay? All enzymes don't like these fatter things, and Rubisco particularly doesn't like this fatter carbon, and it discriminates it. It doesn't take it as much. It doesn't like it. So, because Rubisco doesn't like it, it keeps it out, say discriminates, so plant and biomass should have less 13C than the air. This difference is del called delta 13C. That's right. Plant biomass does, but the decrease is not as big as you would expect. And this is very, was very puzzling, and I'm going to explain why. This, the paper has some very, very elegant physics. I'm going to completely vulgarise this. So, Rubisco doesn't like 13 CO2, so the CO2 comes in, these are CO2 molecules, comes in through the stomata, these holes, accumulates here, but it's not used, so the 13 CO2 gets enriched here, it goes up. The stomata are open, so it goes back out again bit of wind, it gets blown away. And it ends up with that going away. And that's the composition of the plant with a little bit of 13C, but more grey stuff than in the air. Very simple. Now, what happens if the stomata are closed? Again, Rubisco doesn't use it. The stomata are closed. It can't go back out again. So what happens is, blah, I have to take the damn stuff anyway. And then you end up with a plant with a lot more 13 C. So depending upon how close, how close the stomata are, it varies the amount of 13 C the plant has to measure, take. So this gives a beautiful integrated measure of the efficiency with which the plant has been regulating the loss of water for every carbon dioxide it takes up. And this was realized very early and started using for plant breeding. I mean, this was started by about the mid-1990s, that you can be quickly screened, mass spec, a breeding for high water use efficiency. They were already talking about this then. Uh, the plants came on the market. This was classical breeding. The plants came on the market in the last five years. Uh, there's a couple on there. There's a couple of the guys who were involved in driving the work. Uh, it came through. It had a higher yield than the best yields, cultivars being used in Australia. And uh, this is another, this is actually taken from an American uh, breeder's website. High yield, and now this is why it's difficult. That helps the drought tolerance. Also, keeping it resistant to bad soil. Short stems, so it doesn't fall over. Resistance to the major fungi, you have to keep that in there. Semi-dwarf, so it doesn't fall over again. And good flower quality. All of these things had to be kept in while doing this breeding. Now, now an example from gene technology. The other approach you could take would say, OK, this is very complicated. Let's just have less tomato. And this is what a group in Sheffield recently did. This work is at a very, very early stage, but they basically used uh, uh, knowledge about development, about men mental biology, knowledge about how many stomata you make to put in a gene which decreased the, the density of stomata. This, this was the density, and they have the first evidence, this is from lab experiments, that they're using less water in the seedling growth stage. So from here to the field is a large step, but at least there's a concept there to follow it through. And I'm sure other people are moving in that same direction. Now, what about the rest of the Calvin Benson cycle enzymes? Is Rubisco the only thing? It was thought to be very important in early models, and correctly, these models, incidentally, are enormously important in plant biology, but also in global carbon biology. But are other things also limiting? Should we be looking elsewhere? And this is where gene technology came in, because with gene technology, you could basically decrease the amount of protein in a leaf compared to the normal in a wild type, and then look at the effect it had on the rate of photosynthesis. If it looks like that, it's a limiting. Yeah, straight relationship, that's limiting. If it looks like that, you can get rid of most of it without an effect, it's non-limiting. This is actually one of the major reasons why many genes, many alleles are dominant and recessive. 
Getting rid of half of the protein has no effect. It's the major reason for, I think, dominance and recessiveness. And in some cases, you might have a bit of a slope here, partly limiting. So this approach could be used, and it was used. And cutting a long story short, some of these were partly limiting. Uh, a detail here, as these they sometimes were, because another emerging story was whether an enzyme was a problem enzyme in the sense of holding the whole process up, depended on prehistory and conditions, and I think that can be extrapolated to humans. If humans aren't problems by birth, it's history and conditions that makes them problems. So then th I'm going to flip through this. So groups uh, in Essex and the USA have then been taking some of these identified enzymes, pushing them up so there's more of them, and looking to see if they can increase yield. And this was, I think, in Arabidopsis in growth chambers. They got bigger plants. That's not that exciting. Then wheat growing in the greenhouse. Again, they're getting more photosynthesis and bigger plants. And uh, a very recent paper in soybean where they put it into soybean and then grew it out in the field in air and in with elevated CO2 and elevated temperature. And again, they were getting higher yields. So this is moving sort of close to something which could be really interesting for moving on towards uh, the next stage. Now, back to Rubisco. If you can't make it better, why not just give it more CO2? Yeah, just put it back into the atmosphere which we had two billion years ago. Yeah, that would solve the problem. You need a CO2 pump. Very simple. Problem is, do you ever see a plant with a pump? And you can think of a way of stick a pump into a plant and the answer is we don't have to in that sense because many plants have evolved carbon dioxide concentrating mechanisms. Almost all algae, both the bacterial uh, uh, blue-green algae and algae, so-called eukaryotic, have got CO2 pumps which allow them to concentrate CO2 inside them. And some land plants, and I'll come on to this later. So the basic thinking here is if we can understand what components are in these pumps and how they work, maybe we can introduce them into crop plants. Simple thought. Now take one example. This is a photosynthetic bacteria. All of the rubisco is in a little structure, very little structure. And bicarbonate is pumped into this structure. And you can then turn bicarbonate into CO2. The simplest way is you just put a bit of acid in it, a bit of vinegar. And the bicarbonate solution goes, Psh! that's the CO2 coming out. Now, work in the last 20 to 30 years, biochemical and genetic work, had really sorted out what proteins are involved in getting the rubisco in there, making the surrounding, what are they doing? So these were known. And so the approach which is being taken is to just throw these genes into tobacco, first step, and see if you can reform these structures. And basically, this is these structures. They're reforming. There's still a long way to go to getting the pump, is they have to get the bicarbonate pumped as well. But it's the first step, at least you can get these structures reassembled inside a plant. I'm going to jump over the next couple of slides. Uh, yep. OK, now we come to land plants. Now, this is a biochemical carbon dioxide pump sketched at the bottom. I'll start with a theory and then come to what happens. If you could take CO2, you could assimilate it into something else. Here, I've just put three carbons. You may make a four-carbon compound. This would be malate. Yeah? And then somewhere else where Rubisco is, you let, release the CO2 again, and you recycle that. So you basically have a cycle going, which is moving CO2 to where Rubisco is and building up the CO2. This is a biochemical pump. Does it exist? Yes. There are some scientists in Queensland working on sugarcane, well, what else do you do in Queensland? Sugarcane? Well, repeating Calvin and Benson's experiments, and they found it was different. In, in chlorella, and most plants, the first thing which is made after putting in CO2 has got three carbons. In sugarcane, it had four carbons, and it was this guy. And this is what they discovered. Now, putting this into the context, yeah. What's happening is these are in two different cell types. This is the cell which is open to the air, and here you put the carbon, which actually carbon dioxide, I'm simplifying it into malate. This moves into the middle of the leaf. There the CO2 is released, and here's rubisco, and this is sort of loosely related to the leaf anatomy. So, 
This differs from, let's say, normal plants, and I'll come back to how many of those there are, in two things. One is the biochemistry, this pump, and the second is the whole leaf anatomy has changed. These cells here are much bigger, they're full of photosynthesis, there's only two or three cells in between them, each is basically linked, whereas here's the photosynthesis and the veins are very far apart. So that means these are separated by big changes in the biochemistry, big changes in the leaf development, and big changes in what different cells do. Awful lot of changes. But they have lots of advantages. Much higher rates of photosynthesis, much less water is lost. I heard a talk recently from a colleague where he reckoned you could decrease the water loss by 50 to 60 percent uh, in, with this strategy. Higher temperature optimum, I won't go into why, and they need less protein, I won't go into why. It's evolved multiple times. This is complex. You're talking about hundreds of genes changing. It's evolved multiple times in 60 different plant lineages. It's been 60 times this has evolved in the last 30 million years. What has it? Many of our most important tropical and subtropical crops, like maize and sugarcane. What doesn't have it? Almost all of our major crops otherwise. Why did it evolve? Because this gave the grant why you even think we could do this. It's all evolved in the last 20 to 30 million years. And it evolved in the last 20 to 30 million years after a major decrease in carbon dioxide levels to below what we have today. There would have been massive selective pressure to find a way around this problem with Rubisco. And so what these groups of land plants did is they found a way to pump CO2 into the middle of the leaf. 60 different times at least. So this is complicated. The thought can come, if nature has done it more than 60 times, surely we can do it too? Hmm. That's the challenge. And so here, I'm not going to give much data about this because it's confidential in a sense, but there's a large group of people working, funded by the Bill Gates Foundation, Belinda and Bill Gates Foundation called C4 Rice, and their aim is to try to do this. And this is sort of some of the characters. Uh, ambitious project, uh, Bill She said, a long-term complex project will take a decade or more uh, to complete. He was certainly right there. And I think I'll jump over what we're trying to do. Actually, I'll just pull in one thing. It's a fascinating problem, because we have two separate problems. We have to change development by pulling the veins closer together, by getting cells to turn, make, do photosynthesis, which normally wouldn't, and we have to modify the biochemistry. And I've 12 or more genes. And there's actually, these two things are being done separately at the moment. Let's fix the leaf anatomy. Let's try to get the biochemistry working. And then let's try to bring them together. We don't do it at the same time. Too complicated. So how am I doing for time? Five minutes. Uh, five minutes. OK, then I can do this. So now I've done photosynthesis. But of course, I often get asked, if you can make more photosynthesis, will the plant use the extra sugar? Ottiline touched on this in her talk, and I touched on it with a response to elevated CO2, which was we get more yield, but not as much as we might expect from more photosynthesis. So what's going to happen if the plant gets more sugars? Well, the one scenario is it'll stimulate growth, and particularly it'll stimulate things which allow growth in the long term. More branches, more flowers, more seeds. That's what we want in the end to harvest our seeds, our tubers, and so on. But another scenario is the plant goes obese, turns into a couch potato, and you inhibit photosynthesis. The couch potato, I'll have to credit that to Wolf Frommer. He was the person who made this joke the first time that I heard. So I have to credit Wolf for that. Which is happening. Well, you can imagine the answer is both. Now, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. One, I think, is a very nice, important paper, and this is from Jen Sheen, whose name I'll mention. came out in 1990 in plants who showed what people in bacteria and fungi had been suspecting for some time, that sugars regulate expression of lots and lots of genes. And some of the genes which were affected was sugar repressed genes for photosynthesis, so it turned genes for photosynthesis off. This was a paper which came out from Lothar Wilmitter's group at about the same time. Without going to the detail, they accidentally blocked sugar export out of the leaf. It was accidental. And they got these strange plants, which were basically just bleaching off everywhere. And after a bit of work, it turned out that this is because inhibiting sugar export from the leaves leads to dismantling of the photosynthetic machinery. So these are the same, the same thing. There is feedback. Yeah, you, uh, then, 
Jen's paper also found lots of genes involved with growth, which was whose expression was stimulated by sugar. And I'm just pulling out one or two examples, also from Lothar Wilmetter's group, about 1993. They, throwing genes into potato, they did something which disturbed the potato growth and led to high sugar. And what they got was the husband's nightmare, which is enormous numbers of small potatoes which you have to peel. Yeah. But basically, they have decided, instead of making six or seven large tubers, they'd make about 50 small tubers. Immediately tells us that something here from metabolism is regulating how many tubers you're making. And then a couple of recent examples. Uh, this is a paper which showed, moving more into the detailed signaling, a paper showing that a compound which is thought to be involved in signaling how much sucrose you have is regulating flowering. It's not the only thing, but it's interacting with other pathways that regulate when a plant flowers. Or a paper which I very much liked in sorghum, which showed that the amount of tillering, the amount of side branches which are coming out, is closely related to the amount of photosynthate which that plant is making. I really like this paper. So if you have lots of resources, make more tubers, make more children. Or uh, something which came out recently, which again links this branching to, probably to a specific sugar signal. Now what I want to say here is, we don't understand the mechanisms yet. This still has to be tied in with how all the other known things are working. We need this knowledge. But nevertheless, uh, one of my colleagues, very brave, this was uh, uh, somebody in Rothamsted, together with Syngenta, decided about 2004, I think it must have been, just to throw some of these genes in, in colossal amounts, different genes, different promoters, and just look to see if anything happened. Very, very courageous. And, well, they published a paper two or three years ago where they see that one of these many, many experiments led to increased yield in maize, and particularly in drought conditions. They don't fully understand why, but it looks as if there's something there to be done. And, uh, yeah, ah, uh, hit the wrong one. Ah, jump over, jump over that. Okay, so, summary. I've got, I'll go through this quickly. I think one point is that there are many factors which can improve the f f world food security and supply. But one of them is plant breeding, which, if correctly deployed, can increase yield and do it while decreasing the environmental footprint. A second is advances in our advances in our understanding of photosynthesis over the last 60 years are paving the way, and I'll be very careful here, paving the way for major advances in crop breeding and crop yield. The one advantage I've brought, which has actually got a thing out on the market, is the water use efficiency in Australia. The third general point is this involves not only knowing which genes or proteins are involved, but how they're regulated, finding ways to monitor photosynthesis and associated uh, processes in a precise and rapid way, and deploying high-quality field trials. You have to have all of these things, three things together. A uh, further point is uh, that up to now, these have almost all been tested in model species. And a major challenge in the next five years is to deploy these into important crops and in an ergonomic situation, a fully ergonomic situation. This will not be trivial. Uh, application of fundamental knowledge of one trait must be combined with retaining the other traits. Ottiline made this point when you're doing the breeding. The same point also comes to anything else you do. There are multiple traits which have to be maintained. They're so important, you can't afford to lose them. And this is, again, work. And uh, this is a point which may be more um, topical, but I think emphasizes why we need basic knowledge. Most of the transgenic plants which have been widely marketed to date, I'm thinking about BT and Roundup Ready, involved introducing a new gene, which is not in a plant, which gave a new characteristic which the plant didn't have before. And they didn't have to interact with the endogenous pathways, signaling pathways, developmental pathways. They just went in there. I call them ectopic dominant. If the things I've been talking about, and many of the things which I think breed, which scientists and breeders would like to do, involve modifying, changing the endogenous pathways to operate better in the crops, in the conditions in which they're growing. This may be much more difficult because of all the interactions you're going to have in this network, 
but also it will be absolutely dependent on understanding of the complex networks which we're playing about with. So thank you.